13. Gulf County Board of County Commissioners now in session. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull page uh, 16, please, and the consent agenda to for some discussion and maybe shed some light on that. Well, I don't know if it'd be better for the board to uh, handle it at the end. Uh, I think, I think let's, let's get it going. Well, let's go now. Yeah. Okay, we have with us. Uh, from the Florida Probation Service, Mr. Richard Stewart back here, Mr. Billy Rogers, and Miss Amy Kelly. Wherever we're with the board, we can go ahead and address it now. Of the agenda, or wait and prove it all at one time, or disapprove this, or how you want to do this? I think we can address this, and then we can approve the entire consent. Yeah, my my question on it, and uh, I'd like to, uh, for these people to come up. Is, in fact, there's some maybe I need some education on it, and uh, maybe uh, Mr. Stewart and Mr. Rogers can shed some light on this. Uh, I think it's just strictly for the information that we can get out of this. So, Mr. Chairman, it's your call if you'd like to. Bring them up to. Uh, yes, we can bring them on up. Let's bring uh, it on. Take care. Mr. Stewart, would you come up, please? I don't want to come in the Can you give me that? You use that. My name is Richard Stewart. I'm president, CEO, and owner of Prada Probation Center. We have been in, I have been in the probation business for 12 years. Prada Probation has been in existence for two years. I worked for the prior company that had your probation for 10 years. I think there's some, some misnumbers going around, and I think there's some misconcept of what probation is. I want to clarify this for you. At this current time, Florida Probation Service has a caseload of 55 active probationers, 16 conditional release probationers, and five pretrial release probationers. We're talking Gulf County. Gulf County alone. <laughs> no. That nets down to a net revenue at the end of the year of $50,130. That's before expenses. Before, before expense. That, that's just net income. Right. So I've heard the figure seventy-five thousand. I don't know where you're going to get that from. First of all, I don't think anybody that you're going to have do probation is going to do it for free. Somewhere their salary is going to have to be charged to probation. At this current time, I paid, and I'm going to just be honest because it's on my website. I paid Billy Rogers thirty-three thousand dollars a year to conduct probation in, in, in Gulf County. I pay you $9,000 a month for a lease on the sheriff's substation. I pay $2,400 a year to provide internet to your sheriff's department at that building. They pay nothing for internet, I pay. You su you're signing by Sheriff Harrison's annex with internet. So, repeat those numbers for me, now, right? That nine, yeah. Come back, you said 9000 I pay you all $750 yeah, yeah. a month in rent for that sheriff's substation. Okay. So if you figure that out, I'm, I, and I'm going to be honest with you, Billy collects 94% of the probation fees. Your last probation company, County, collected 33%. Billy has a $30,000 software program developed specifically for Florida Probation Service that is at his fingertips. These numbers that I gave you, he can pull up in a second. Can, it, can we go back and clear my mind just a little bit on the Excuse me, with a $9,000 a month figure. That's I don't, you, uh, is that a correct figure? $9,000 a month? That's what I'm saying. A year. A year. Okay. Seven fifty a month. That's a lot of difference. I'm okay. sorry. Seven okay. fifty a month, 9000 a year. Okay. But I, I wanted to I wanted to go back to those numbers. I think you had 33000 in salary. 
Mm -hmm. You had seven fifty uh, in rent mm -hmm. that goes again. And you had another. You had another huge number there. Twenty four hundred dollars uh, per month or year. Per year. Twenty four hundred dollars a month for internet. Internet. Like thirty three thousand. Twenty four hundred and nine thousand. So seven fifty a month rent. Mm -hmm. Thirty three thousand salary. <laughs> Twenty four hundred for the internet, mm -hmm. and you collected fifty five thousand. Is that what you said? Last year. But Richard, you're going in the hole. But again, I'm not really going in the hole because Bay County subsidizes this county. I do this for this county because we do a great job. Everybody in this community, stand up, Billy. Everybody in this community, from the judge to the sheriff to the state attorney and the public defender, have the utmost respect for Billy Rogers. We do things for your court that we don't do for anybody else. I'll give you an example. About six months ago, Judge McFarland called me and said, Richard, we don't have a breathalyzer. I need one in court. I need to test these people. I got him a breathalyzer for court. Billy does this about all the plea agreements for the state attorney himself. And I think these are the things that probation is more than collecting fees. You have to supervise classes. In my office, we teach anger management, shoplifting, victim impact, financial responsibility, substance abuse. I have two professional doctor degree psychologists that come to my office once every three months and do substance abuse classes. They have written 15 books between them on substance abuse. And they contract with me to come do it. Where are you going to get these resources? I, I, you know, I see in this, this was come from uh, Michael. Now, I've had better years, Ron, I'll tell you. But my question, is, my question is, nobody, something's wrong here, gentlemen, because nobody's going to operate a business and keep it going in the red. Um, I know you said Bay County subsidizes you and all, but somebody's got to be making money here is my point. Tom, um, I'm going to be honest with you. I probably will make eight or nine hundred dollars a month by the time everything is over. But it's a lot to make profit. Yes. But that's fine with me. Because it keeps Billy employed and it keeps the court happy. I want to hear from Mr. Hammonds. One other question, if I may. Uh, uh, Mr. Stewart, to touch on, uh, let's see here. About the liability, what type of liability? Let's say one of these uh, people that's on probation or under things. If you do a bad warrant backward, what if, happens? Who if I do a bad warrant, I carry a million dollar liability policy. That would be on me. If you do it, it's on you. The other thing that you need to understand is right now, Billy Rogers gets the calls at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning because you put somebody's child in jail. You're going to get those calls because it's county-run probation. In the last eight years that we've had this, we have never had a lawsuit, and we have never had a constitutional infringement. I can point you to four other counties that do county probation that have had multiple lawsuits because they did a bad warrant, because they put somebody in jail for a reason they shouldn't have put them in jail. Now, you don't put them in jail, the judge does, but you prepare the warrant, so you're liable. Mr. Hammond, can we hear from you? I, I don't want to debate Mr. Stewart about the merits of the deal. It's, it's a good thing for the county to take it back over. We can run it in-house. We can run it more efficiently. And we can defer some of the costs that, uh, that you're paying for law enforcement corrections by running it in-house. Main, main way we're going to save money is not hiring anybody. We're going to run it in-house in the jail. And, uh, and I, I don't necessarily agree with Richard's numbers. I, I don't agree with the, with the, with the lawsuit. We, the first lawsuit the county had was when we hired Richard with his new company and they threatened to sue us and took us all the way to the edge based on the contract with the way he got hired. So at the end of the day, the, the last year the county ran it, when the county ran it and hired, had an employee and a secretary, we collected 44000 and some change in fees. The probation fees are double what they were when the county ran it, now that it's been run by a private deal, and they're running uh, pretrial release. So I, I don't agree with the numbers, but the clerk's office don't have the numbers because it's... For for some reason they're not getting him, and uh, which I think is a is is a problem too. It's it's, it's an audit situation, but uh, 
We have the capability of running a house. We can run it more efficiently. It'll be better for the, for the public. And if we make one dollar, it's better than what you make today because you're not making anything. Right. Well, basically, what, what you're saying, we don't have the numbers coming from within our clerk's so money does not run through the clerk's office. It runs directly through them. Question. Here. Can I approach? All right, let me, yeah. I'm going to talk about that stuff. Uh, my number is available seven days a week. And say the word the clerk's office don't have them. The money's not running through the clerk's office. The, the clerk gets a, court, a, a report of every check we issue them. And on that subject, in the last year, we have collected. Hold up for a minute. Go ahead, Rick. In the last year, we have collected $137,264 for the clerk. We don't get any of that money. County does not get one penny of that money. That goes to the clerk. Question. Say we take it back in house. Who's going to keep up with the money? We're going to collect it and turn it over to the clerk. Just All like right. we do with anything else. Does the clerk have the staff to handle it? It's the clerk's responsibility. What I'm saying is this. I don't, if we do this, and this is the reason I asked Mr. Stewart to come here and these questions. Now, we are six months from now, we wait, we we, we got to have three people. And then we go from the black, supposedly, bringing in money, we're in the red, we're coughing out money. That's, that's, that's what I don't want to get into. I don't want to get into now. There's a clerk going to say, well, wait a minute, i got to have an employee now to handle this probation. That it's, Now it's being handled outside. It's private. We contracted it out. I can't speak for the clerk. There's absolutely no reason for We're not hiring any more people to run the program. She shouldn't hire any more people to, to take the money in. I mean, that's just... Do you have the trained personnel? Do you have the part of schooling you can go I, and get? I, 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 I know you're going to have to. Everybody, I, I work uh, inmate, uh, it works my crew. He's in school this morning. I'm getting no, no work done in my district. But uh, about schooling, we got to figure, you got, you got to factor all this in. I agree, um, Commissioner, that it's it's a much bigger issue than just the dollars. And um, we could possibly have issues of uh, liability. And based on what we have received in the consent agenda, I, I don't see how we can make a decision of this magnitude based on this small amount of information. I, I think it's well beyond... Um, the decision to be made on this one piece of paper. There's a lot of, uh, of various factors that we need to look at to make this decision. And it, it's, I'm having a little trouble getting my head around that we have staff. I, from what I see, our, our staff is all quite busy and they've picked up various um, duties as we've cut back on staff, that, that we have staff that can pick up all of this work without needing any additional staff. Um, it, are the folks that are working in the jail, are they we can, have time we, on their hands? We, or? we can handle it in-house. It's not something that is, is taken lightly, but this is where we're at. And we, we discussed this for about three months in the Budget Review Committee. As we stand right now, you are at least $1 million in the hole. You are facing the worst budget that your, this board has had in 22 years, since 1991 when you raised taxes. If you do nothing, if you just keep the same services that you've got today, you're going to raise close to a million tax. Just one thing, and I brought this today to, to talk about, just the state's changes to retirement are going to cost the Gulf County Board of County Commissioners a quarter of a million dollars that you've got to come up with somewhere. So we have to do things outside the box. This is going to be a headache for me. There's absolutely no doubt. But it is going to defer some of the costs that's being put, passed on to the taxpayer, and we can run the program more patiently. Uh, this, this didn't start with just money. This started with some dissatisfaction with the program. But at the end of the day, we can run it in-house. The county ran it forever before. We contracted out. There were, there were reasons why we contracted out. We should have never had a probation officer and a secretary. There was, you know, there were a lot of problems with the old program. We can run it in-house and, and control those programs and can defer some of the costs. Here's, here's, here's where I'm at. I, I, for the last five years that I've been on this board, every year we have reduced what we're, what we're spending. We, we've cut 40. Between, I, I've always said 40. It's actually 
between 40 and 50 percent out of this budget. We have got to think outside the box. We have got to take measures that save the taxpayers dollars. I've got a staff person that's well versed in, in, in what probation is about. He runs a jail. Uh, he's telling me that we can save money and we can run it in-house and I am not prepared to raise taxes and, and ignore uh, our staff that says that we can save the taxpayer money on this. Uh, Richard, you and I have been buddies for a long time. It's not about that. It's about, and you've been, you've sat on the, on the Board of County Commissioners. You know these budget issues. We're, we're, we're in a crunch. But I'm a right 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 right. and I've been a commissioner for eight years. Probation ain't your answer. Yeah. You're going to end up in the black. First of all, you're not thinking. Somebody's got to buy vehicle mobilization clubs. They're expensive. Because you've got to do vehicle mobilizations according to the statute. Somebody's got to buy a drug test. Because you've got to do drug tests because they're required by the statute. Richard, we can debate all these issues, but at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, I'm willing, if it's going to save the taxpayer money, and my staff says that they can run it for savings to the taxpayer, I'm going to have to support it for one year to see if, if in fact, we can run it and save the taxpayer's money. And that's, well, that's what I'm saving the taxpayer's money. I don't cost the taxpayers one penny. At the end of the day, we'll save tax. The yeah, tax dollars about what we collect. You can't call it taxpayers' dollars. It's not taxpayers' dollars. <laughs> but I, I look at it. It's not. It's not just like taxpayer dollars, but it's green coming back, and we're looking for a revenue stream. Okay. Well, I would you to do it, but I'm going to tell you right now. In a year from now, you're going to be hunting a private probation company because, first of all, he's not. He said he can run it more efficiently. I'd argue that all day long. He does not have. A $30,000 software system designed specifically to do probation. You're going to be back to hand file folders. Somebody's going to get lost in the shuffle, and you're going to be sued. But with that, if you decide to do it, fine, more power to you. We'll be shut down this afternoon at 5. And you can take it over. That's what your contract says. It says you have 60 day out. And I mean, that's, that's not a that's part of the contract. The, the, entire, the entire system is broken. I mean, it, it borders on a scam, the entire deal. And that's why you should, it's, it's probably you contract out law enforcement. You cannot contract, contract, contract out law enforcement. You cannot contract out law enforcement where you have the ability to put people in jail when they don't pay a private contractor. That is a problem. It is a problem when the clerk does not know what's been collected from a probationer, how much money, and, and what fees. It's a problem. And, and that's why it needs to be run in-house. And I mean, and at the end of the day, we can run it more efficiently. And it, and it won't be one of these, you, you pay your money up front, and we can only terminate when you, you, you do this, and, and, and you know, we're not going to follow up on you. Uh, it needs to be run professionally, and it doesn't need to be run for, an out, uh, for a profit business. Thank you, Michael. You're making a perfect argument to keep it private. What I'm, what I'm sitting I'm here saying, I don't miss Hoffman to clarify something. What, what I'm sitting here saying, first of all, we got a number one in charge administration. We got a number two. Both of these guys telling us that this can work, that it, they can make it work. But I'm willing to look into it. I want to look at it, make sure I just look at everything and look at but. But the guys that we got that give us our information, they are telling us that we can make this work. I'm ready. No power to you. Mr. Chairman, um, the, the issue that I have is that we haven't seen any kind of a plan of how this would work. All we've seen is this. At least that's all I've seen. And I don't, it, for us to make a change, I think we need to see how we're going to make it work in-house so that we can see some of the details, some type of a plan of how it works. I, I don't know when the last time the services were bid, is there someone else out there that would provide uh, a better price or a better service if you are not happy with the service. This may not, the, the way things are going right now may not be the solution, but I don't know that just bringing it in-house with no details of how we would handle it, of us taking that on today, I don't think that's the answer either. I think we need more information. You know, I, I, I don't disagree about more information, but I've been talking to staff for two or three months on this issue. I've, I've, I've had, had this conversation with Don. I've had this conversation with Michael. They've convinced me that they can save the taxpayers' dollars by the revenue stream that this can generate. Now, I don't know if that's our, at the end of the day, I don't know if that argument's going to be correct or not, but I'm willing to take the risk when we are a are million dollars in the hole to the taxpayer, and that's just where I'm at. At the end of the day, Richard, we may come back a year and say, Richard, you were right. 
You were absolutely correct, and we're gonna we're gonna go out well, again. But I, however, I, I don't guarantee you that I would do that. Anymore. Well, at, well at, at the end of the day, I, I don't tell you. I, I, hold on, hold on, Mr. Stewart. Hold on. At the end of the day, I've got the taxpayers in mind. That's the only thing I have in mind, and my staff. Law professionals in many different ways have told me that they can save the taxpayers' money. At the end of the day, I've got to take, I've got to try that, and I'm ready to do it today. And and you know we've got budget session that's been 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 involved with with our commissioner here. They have discussed it for the last two or three months in budget, and and I, I just guys, you've got to understand if you're not prepared to make tough decisions to decide where we're going to go with all of our programs, then just get prepared to, to up the taxpayers to, to, to the tune of $1 million for this next budget cycle. Uh, Mr. Chair, we leave. Thank you for coming. But, uh, Jeff, who's going to pick up your internet? Who's going to pick up your light bill? If Mr. Stewart, because we're using this money to offset that he pays us every month goes toward offsetting. You gonna pick it up? That's that's up to the county provide the uh, services and build them there. But if, if that's something y'all choose not to do, well, we can close the uh, substation down. We'll move everything south here, whatever we got to do. Well I'm prepared to I'm I'm in agreement with I can't afford to take over the uh, the substation there within itself and do everything that we need to do to keep it operational. I couldn't do that. But uh, um, I'm, I'm at the board here. Okay, so Mr. Stewart leaves. About a 99% chance you're leaving. We'll just have to look at the numbers. I know. We'll have to look at the numbers, and I go back to Commissioner 3 over here. We're basing the big decision here on a couple of paragraphs. I know I'm, I'm on the budget, and I've sat on it. We've had I've been we've been hacking this over in our budget. And will it generate enough money? Is it worth We'll collect enough money off of it. These are things you got to look at. That's a decision, you know, y'all going to have to make. We had a substation prior to uh, yeah. uh, them being in house there, and I would love to be able to keep it going. Uh, well, I do too for the people of Rural Hitchcock. It seems like every time we turn around, something's being pulled from us, something being pulled from us. We need that. And I don't know if we could go to the city of Rural Hitchcock and they'd agree to pick up the slack and that you provide services for the city. I'll, I'll, that I don't know, but this is some more things we've got to look into. I'll fight to keep it open, but uh, you know, when they compromise the services and, and deputies on patrol, uh, to sacrifice that and have that open, I'll have to look at it and weigh out the options there. Okay. I want to make one statement, and I'm going to sit down. The statement that Mr. Hammond made that it's a scam is an honest slap in the face of everybody in my office. My officers are very professional. They conduct a professional probation office. Billy Rogers is more respected than anybody you've got on staff down here in the court system. And Billy does a good job. It's not a scam. It's supervising probationers. We run an 85 to 95 percent successful termination rate. You ain't never going to have that. Not under any hope are you ever going to have that. So I'm going to take exception to that statement, but I'm going to leave gracefully. Have a good day. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. Well, gentlemen, Gulf County is a business, and it should be run on sound business principles. And when a business takes something back in-house that it was contracting out, typically there's some type of a business plan set up, something in writing. And I appreciate, Commissioner Yeager, that you've been discussing this with staff, but we haven't seen anything in writing. It really should be planned out so that we know what to expect. I, too, want to save the taxpayers' dollars. But you can't be penny-wise and pound-foolish, because that will not save taxpayer dollars. At, at the end of the day, I've got staff that I've talked to for three months, and I'm sure that other members of this board have talked to for three months that have convinced me that we can save the taxpayers' dollars. And that's what we're up here to do, just try to run most efficient county that we can absolutely run. And, and with that, I'm, I'm convinced we can do it, and I'm supportive of it. Well, if you've spent three months discussing it, why couldn't something have been written up for us to review and approve? You know, I, I, there at the end of the day, 
Well, we as commissioners have a responsibility to know what's going on in the budget committee and know what's going on with staff and have those conversations. If you had had a sit-down conversation that I've had with Mr. Hammond and Mr. Butler on this issue, I believe that you would be convinced also that, that we could save the taxpayers money by doing this. At the end of the day, I know Richard didn't do a good job. I, I have had a sit-down conversation with Mr. Butler about this. I've also worked in the system in the jail system and with probation. And I have serious concerns about us taking this in-house. But from what I'm understanding, I'm listening to Mr. Yeager. If we don't do it, we just sit here and don't do something, we're going to have to raise taxes. It's That's just right. that simple. It's coming. But you know, we've had... Sit here and don't do nothing. And it ain't, we're not saying that they don't do a good job. I'm not saying that they don't do a good job. But what we're saying, we got to try to figure out some type of way... <laughs> to get some type of revenue stream coming into the county or some type of way that we got to cut back on something without hurting our constituents because like Mr. Mike Daniel just said, we started taking things away, but a lot of people is not sitting down in these meetings that we go to and sit down in and look at the number, and that's what they got us up here for, to look at these numbers. Uh, Ms. Brown, if you wish to actually have it tabled so you can look at some more stuff, I mean, Put that on the floor and actually have it tabled so you can look at some more information on it. I, I'm, all I have is staff to work on. They, they, they tell me that we could do something and we go over it and I question them and I ask them, uh, different questions about it and at the end of the day they convince me that that we could do it. And, and, and that's where I'm at, Mr. Chairman. That's why I'm going to put a motion on the floor that we approve the consent agenda with this included. I'll put that motion to the floor. Well, I got a motion on the floor by Mr. Yeager. I have to second it because of the budget issue. You know, I, I hope that at the end of the day we don't have to raise property taxes or taxes, but with a million dollar shortfall, uh, I think we have to go outside the box and look at things. And, and there's going to be an issue addressed today up here, you know, to where I could look at that money that we may be saving and point it in another direction that's, that's highly more important than what we're discussing today. I got, a, I got a motion by Mr. Yeager. I got a second by Mr. Michael Moore. Do I have any opposed? Before the vote, I would, I would like for you all to consider tabling this for um, the next meeting. I don't understand the rush, and I would like to ask Mr. Hammond to submit um, something more detailed than this on how he's going to accomplish this with the current staff. Uh, you know, uh, several different issues that I've agreed with you on that we've put off. You know, with one was waste management a couple of meetings ago that we've had all the information. I've had all my information. I, I'm going to leave the motion on the floor as it stands. I got a motion by Mr. Yeager. I'm opposed. I got a second by Mr. Michael Moore. Got, do I have any opposed? I'm opposed. Got, I'm opposed. Got, uh, let me go back on this one right here. Let's start this over. Ms. Bryan, how you vote? I'm opposed. Okay. Mr. Michael how you vote? Yes. Mr. Yeager, how you vote? Yes. Mr. Mike Daniel, how you vote? No. Chair vote yes. Pass three to two. Now let's go back to the consent agenda. Do we, do? That, that included all the consent agenda. That, that right. included the whole consent agenda. Okay, no. right. Mr. Chairman, we have Tony Whitfield from the TDC. Commissioners, um, at our regular TDC board meeting last Tuesday, it was brought to our attention that it was the first anniversary of Jennifer Jenkins. Uh, hey. Coming on as director of the TDC, and looking out back over the last year, it's uh, pretty amazing the strides she's made in such a short time. Uh, first, uh, she had to make the move to a new town, <laughs> become acquainted, and settled in. That took about a day. And then she put together a brand new team. Uh, that took another day. Then she had to weed through the chaos that she inherited. That only seemed to take a day or so. The point is, she very quickly started moving forward and putting together programs to promote Gulf County tourism. 
and there they working. Uh, just a few other things, and I'm sure y'all have all seen the numbers. Um, my website visits are over eight, up over 81 percent from a year ago. Visits to the Welcome Center are up over 44 percent, and uh, bed tax revenue is up over 15 percent year to date. And that growth expands throughout the, every sector of Gulf County's economy. On behalf of Chairman Warner and all the members of the TDC Advisory Board, I uh, want to thank the Board of County Commissioners for having the wisdom to find a TDC director with the skill sets of Ms. Jenkins. At the end of week, uh, last week's meeting, a motion was made, seconded, and unanimous, unanimously passed to make a commendation to the Board of County Commission regarding Director Jenkins' performance and achievements in her first year. All that being said, we would like to present Director Jenkins with a plaque as a symbol of appreciation for all her accomplishments. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody, commissioners, been very supportive of all that I've done and given me the, you know, the leeway to go and move forward and put some programs in places. Mr. Butler and all my colleagues on the county, I know that there are some days that I'm with them and they have no idea what I'm saying or what I'm doing and who is this chick and what is she saying, but they have support me. Jeremy, you've helped me tremendously with everything, statutes and learning, and you've been patient. Tuan, you paved the way for me when I came in with all the work that you did, and I want to thank you and thank members of the community for welcoming my family and me to Gulf County. I'm very humbled, and um, as long as I'm here, I will do everything I can to not let you all down, and I will do my best with my team. I want to thank my team because they're fantastic. We will do the best we can and make sure that we continue to grow tourism in the right and proper way for Gulf County. Thank you. Thank you, John. Mr. Chairman, we have Katie Bryant. Well, if I can, Mr. Chairman, I'm just going back to the consent and to hate the break stride. I believe the motion was three, uh, the vote was 3-2. Um, and you said it encompassed the consent. I just wanted to ask the commission, is the 3-2 vote with regards to the consent or with regards specifically to page 16, and then you can move on to a second vote with regards to all consent. I just don't know if the commissioners wanted to vote in opposition to the entire consent. The motion was for the entire consent. Okay. That's, that was what was stated. Okay. I just wanted a clarification. Thank okay. you, okay. Mr. Thank you. I don't see Katie Bryant. Um, we have Vicki Schaefer. Going to EMS. Okay. Good morning. Y'all have to excuse me, my computer. I was prepared to um, give you all a letter so that you could read along, but obviously my computer decided to be a little wacky this morning, so I'm going to have to read it to you, so I apologize. Um, this is concerning the EMS and their response to Weewahichika area, specifically the Dow Keith uh, Five Acre Farm area. Okay. It says, on Thursday, May 23rd of 2013 at approximately 10.40 p.m. Central Time. I heard my son, Nicholas Sheffer, sick in a spare bathroom, and upon investigation, I found him sitting on the commode with a small trash can in his lap. He was in the midst of a severe spell of vomiting proceeding along with diarrhea. I asked him if he needed anything, and he replied, yes, a wet rag. After retrieving the rag for him, I told him he need, he need, if he needed me to call me and went back into the living room to play on the computer. And approximately five minutes later, I heard a loud noise and ran to the bathroom. Nicholas was not breathing, making a spastic gurgling sound. His eyes were rolled back in his head, deathly white with a bluish ash color and non-responsive. I grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him vigorously, yelled his name, and performed a strong sternum rub. This action made him take a deep breath, and he fell forward into my arms. 
I set him back upright, held his head erect, called him by name. He awoke and immediately lost consciousness. I again shook him vigorously, repeating the sternum rub. He again, he again awoke only to lose consciousness, and upon my third attempt, I was able to get him to respond. I then yelled to his sister Shelby to call 911. Excuse me, I'm a little emotional. Shelby dialed 911 and handed me the phone. I stated to the operator, I have a 20-year-old male with a severe heart defect. He stopped breathing and is, una and is able to get his breath again. He is responsive. I need an ambulance now. I am a retired nurse. I need an ambulance now. She verified her address and stated, I will get someone en route now. I hung up the phone and instructed Shelby to hold him upright, keep him awake, responsive, and breathing, ran to the bedroom, w awoke his father, Larry, mm -hmm. and got quickly dressed. I went straight back to Nicholas and instructed Shelby to open the front door, put the dog away, and wait in the road in front of our home to signal the ambulance. Larry and I kept Nicholas awake and responsive. At approximately 11.23, 38 minutes after the initial call to 911, the first of two ambulances arrived. Note this time because Shelby received a text as the ambulance was pulling into our yard. Shelby describes the ambulance as driving, creeping down the road with no emergency lights, comes to a complete stop, turns the blinker on, and kept crept toward her even though she was standing in the middle of the road waving at the ambulance at approximately 300 yards in front. An elderly man in his mid-60s to early 70s, heavy set with short hair glasses, walking with a limp, gets out of the truck. He proceeds to walk up our steps by holding onto the handrail, using a dominant leg for each step, carrying only a portable response case. He is not carrying oxygen or a heart monitor machine. He enters our home and precedes me to the restroom where Nicholas is still sitting. He asks him, what's going on? You sick? Nicholas replies, yes, I've been vomiting and have diarrhea. My mom says I had a seizure. Let me stop right here. I explained to Nicholas, because if some of you may or may not know, Nicholas was born with a severe heart defect and has half a heart. And basically, over the years, my husband and I have resuscitated him on more than one occasion. If Nicholas finds out in the middle of one of these spells that he's had that he stopped breathing or something, he freaks out. So I told him instead that he had a seizure so that he would not mentally freak out. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, the EMS worker did not know that. I then answered, no, you quit breathing and you were making a gurgling sound with your eyes rolled back. I said that so that the EMS worker would know what was going on. I told Nick it looked like a seizure, to which the man states, who told you it was a seizure? It isn't a seizure unless the doctor tells you it is. I stated he has a severe heart defect. The man interrupts me and asks me, does he take any meds for that? I said, no. He then asked Nick, have you taken any meds for this tonight? And Nicholas answered him, no. He asked him how he was feeling, to which Nick replied, better. I don't know why you're here. I interrupted him answering, because you stopped breathing and you need to go to the hospital, get checked, and get some IV fluids. The MS worker then said, do you want to go to the hospital? Nick says again, I don't know why I need to go. He, I answered Nick, because you're sick and you quit breathing. The EMS gentleman then checked his O2 sats with a finger monitor, his blood pressure with a manual cuff, listened to his heart and lungs with a stethoscope. He then asked Nicholas, can you stand up? Nicholas answered, I'll try, and proceeded to stand unaided and unstable. The man instructed him to look straight ahead to the wall. Nick asked, can I sit down? And he sat back down on the commode. The man then asked, you think you can walk? And Nick replies, I'll try. The EMS then states, I can't transport you. You'll have to wait for the other truck. I asked him, when are they going to get here? He answered, they'll be here in a little while. Approximately five minutes later, the second ambulance arrives to transport. Three individuals arrive in the second ambulance, a male driver, a female, and a male EMS. 
All three elderly individuals range in age between 60 to early 70s. They start to prep the truck by transport, for transport by opening the back door. Nicholas is then requested to walk to the second ambulance unaided. I stood behind him concerned that he might fall. He made it to the second to the last step to, and sat down, expressing weakness and head ringing. They then tell him, come on, you're almost there. He climbs into the back of the truck and lies down on the stretcher. They covered him with a sheet, used a blood pressure cuff to check his blood pressure. The female checks his pulse with her fingers, and they slowly transport him to Sacred Heart Hospital in St. Joe upon our request. I followed the ambulance all the way to the hospital. The driver drove 55 to 60 with only its regular functioning lights, no emergency lights, and no sirens. We arrived at the hospital at approximately 12 midnight. This total call lasted approximately one hour and 15 minutes. We later learned that the spell and symptoms I described is called a vagal spell. It occurs when the body is forced to respond to a trauma such as a violent vomiting or diarrhea, a spell that all the blood vessels clamp down all at the same time shutting off the oxygen to the brain, as well as all of the body organs instantaneously. It can happen to anybody. In most individuals, they faint and they wake up fairly quickly. But due to Nicholas's specific heart issues, the result was immediate cardiac arrest. <laughs> If one is able to revive the individual, their first initial breath then floods the body with oxygen, sending them into shock. This was not the first time Larry and I have had to respond to Nicholas in an emergency situation. In fact, there have been many, and undoubtedly there will be many more. Having trained and worked as a CNA both in home health care and veteran nursing home, I am accustomed to death. I have personally dealt with many forms and situations. It is a required element and standard of the job where one is trained extensively on basic standard procedures when dealing with a basic life support, breathing, and or cardiac patient. One is trained never to ask a cardiac patient to stand, much less walk. It is common knowledge that to do so can and will trigger a worsening symptom and or heart attack. It is also standard protocol to give the patient oxygen, hook them up to an EKG machine with a heart monitor, monitor the O2 sats continuously, their heartbeat, their blood pressure, and keep the patient calm and still to EMS thrives. The amount of time, the lack of professionalism, and performing standard procedures, waste of equipment and or lack of use of said equipment, and the overall attitude of this situation in this instant is irrehensible. It cannot be allowed to happen anymore. We're very fortunate that it all ended well, and it may not be so the next time. What I have found out in the last few days is stunning. How can it be that Gulf County does not have standard requirements for EMS workers' positions allotted for this county? Even Bay Medical has basic standards for which an EMT worker must pass in order to be hired for this position. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics for the U.S., under the reference of the nature of the work, there is listed the training, qualifications, and requirements for EMS technicians. Items listed but not limited to the following are duties, responsibilities, work environment, and training. A person's life often depends upon the quick response, reaction, and complete competency of the EMS paramedic. Auto accidents, heart attacks, diabetic patients, slips and falls, childbirth, drowning, and gunshot wounds are just some of the things that require immediate medical attention. And following medical protocols and guidelines, it is the responsibility and the duty of the EMS and paramedics to provide this vital service quickly, efficiently, as they care and transport the sick or injured to a medical facility. It is understood and common knowledge that the work environment of the EMS paramedic is significant. It is required for the individual to be able to consider, a, it, is, it requires the individual to be able to do considerable kneeling, bending, heavy lifting, not to mention having the tolerance for the elements 
The work is not only physically strenuous, but can be very stressful as well. Why is it there's no strength requirements for the EMS and paramedics hired through this county? How is it that an individual can retain a position in which they are unable to perform the required needed requirements needed for the job? I'm aware that the county gets past this obstacle by not having physical requirements, thus bypassing the issue. It is a dangerous gamble and a risk that the county is taking by ignoring this problem. I give you an example. As Mr. Chairman, I call for point of order. I think uh, and my point I would state is that Ms. Schaefer here is uh, she stated a problem yes. with with your son and we're beginning to drift out into out and out and a lot of this that you stated the Florida statutes cover that you have to do these things, and we do that. We do that, but uh -oh, let's get back to your son. The issue here, if I may, I'll let she can. Okay. We're getting too spread out here on things. It's okay. not what it, what it boils down to. Okay. Let me let me skip down. What it boils down is the intent of this letter is not to cause the loss of an individual's job or to cause harm is to be politically or to be politically motivated. It's intended to pay, place a spotlight on a very serious problem and the potential dangers of it. The oath of a doctor is to do no harm. It is the intent of this letter is the same. It's not to do any harm. It's the right of every individual in this county to receive adequate, competent, quick response to wherever they live regardless of their pay, regardless of where they live, regardless of who they are, and you're not doing that. And we, I had a, a conversation with Mr. Butler about how, you know, y'all have limited resources, how you have a limited EMS worker, or how you have an on-call paramedic, and I asked, well, why are these individuals here? He said, well, they've been here since the 70s. Okay, I have nothing against age. If you can do the job, do it. But here's the point, gentlemen. I had cardiac surgery a year ago. I can no longer be a nurse because it stresses me too much, the lifting, the whatever. Okay, those individuals that showed up at my house, they have in their possession a chair that they can put the patient in and then it converts down to a, a, a stretcher and then they're supposed to care. They ask my son to stand up and walk. Have you lost your mind? They did not put a heart monitor on this child. Okay, just because he looks okay for right this minute, who's to say that you walk down the steps and get to where they're going and he goes, boom. There wasn't nobody standing beside him to catch him if he fell. I'm sorry, I've had too much training. It was drummed into our heads. There are certain standard, basic things that you do that are not being done. And we're not the only family. My whole point is it's going to cost somebody some lives. It is a national thing that in rural areas, 80 percent, excuse me, 66 percent of the children injured in rural areas die in route. An hour and 15 minutes, I clocked it. Guess what? It took me 10 minutes at the speed limits to drive from my house to their driveway. It took me exactly 10 minutes, 7.1 miles, and that's during the day, during traffic. This is 11 o'clock at night, okay? It also took me 21.8 miles from my house to Sacred Heart. It took me 26 minutes, okay? If you look on the report, which Mr. Butler sent me a printout, the times don't match. Where's their time, though? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, if I can, before any commission comments with regards to Ms. Schaefer's comments, the nature of her comments are a complaint with regards to the EMS and the performance. Um, and obviously, she's just read the report. So if I, would, I would advise the council as well as staff, um, if you are going to offer comments, if you want to offer a response to her, Ms. Schaefer as a mother and her concern for her son, very appropriate. With regards to the specifics of that day, the time, the performance of our EMS staff, I'd advise and counsel you all to first let the EMS and have Ms. Schaefer submit that, let the county staff have that, 
and I would advise you all without the specifics and the facts and the reports in front of you that it wouldn't be appropriate for you to comment with regards to the performance of the EMS staff with regards to the complaint. Ms. Schaefer's concern for her son and a mother's love, certainly very appropriate, but beyond that it wouldn't be appropriate today for any of you to comment with regards to what potentially could be a complaint or some liability as far as the county. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And there's liability. Basically, we just we just listen to her talk. Uh, Commissioner, you can certainly respond to Ms. Schaefer and her concerns. I think the county should take that report that she's typed up and put a lot of time into. I think we should have the county look at it and obviously provide you with the response from uh, Mr. Whitfield being the director as well. Um, I don't know if Mr. Whitfield had an opportunity to review, review that report before today, but without those facts in front of you as well. Mr. Whitfield was the one who responded. I, I understand that, Ms. Schaefer. I understand that. But like I said, with regards to Ms. Schaefer coming today, County, the commission, I would certainly let you all know that first we would look at that with regards to liability and exposure to the county before you offer any specific comments on the performance. Beyond that, general comments are very appropriate. It, the whole thing is I'm not here because I want to lay in the county or put some liability or anything like that. What I'm trying to do is say that this is an opportunity for you to take and put a spotlight on and say, you know what, this is broken and, and we got to fix it. And it's things that doesn't require extra money, gentlemen. You have a school out there with EMS students that are busting their bumps to get out here that need employment. Those who can't do teach, and those who can do do. Do you get where I'm going with this? I understand this? exactly what you're saying. Okay. Thank you, Vicky, for coming. Uh, you and I had a 20-minute conversation about this, and I yeah, and I think it's appropriate for the letter. We'll we'll certainly respond and and and, and get those things for. You. Thank you for coming. Chef, I want to thank you for coming out and bringing this to our attention because if we do have a problem, we do need to get to the point of it. And listening to the uh, the report, you submitted it. We'll look it over again, but listening to the report, uh, I don't have a copy. I'm just going on what you're reading right now. <coughs> kind of like, is it this? I'm just going to hold my comments. Thank you. Your, uh, thank you. Oh, I, I, I will. I brought this so that. If it says one last thing, you've done your job, okay? And that's what you're supposed to be doing, is, is handling it so that the county can, okay? You, you can deal with first responders. You can do volunteer things. You can do all kinds of things. But it needs to be addressed immediately. Yes, it does. Thank you. I, I'd just like to thank her for coming also. This this is the way we correct problems. Yeah. If you bring it to us, <coughs> then we can look at it, and if there's a problem there, we can correct it. So, you know, I thank you for coming. Mr. Mike, Mr. Mike, I don't want to disrespect, but I, what she's reading, I hear a problem. Turn it, in your, turn it into Mr. Butler. Mm -hmm. we'll, get back, we'll get back on it. Okay. Thank you very much. Public hearing. No, oh, I'm sorry. Do you have anything else? That's it, Mr. Chair. We're going to tell the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, um, if you would direct your attention to page 38 um, in your packet for today's uh, agenda, you'll see in there is a public notice with regards to a comprehensive plan amendment. If you recall back two weeks ago, we had a uh, uh, recommendation from the PDRB for a comprehensive um, small-scale land use map amendment uh, with regards to a parcel 02949. Um, that was accepted by this commission unanimously after a unanimous recommendation from the PDRB. Um, the last step in accepting a small land use amendment is to adopt it in the comp plan by uh, ordinance. What you have in front of you, and I'll read it by title, is the ordinance that's been properly advertised by Mr. Richardson for today's public hearing. Um, and after I read it by title, I'd ask the chairman if he would to open it to the public for comment. It's an ordinance amendment and comprehensive plan of Gulf County, Florida, and buying through procedures required for small scale land use amendment pursuant to authority under stat state statute section 163, subsection 3187, and chapter 125 with regards to your home rule. Specifically changing parcel ID 02949. Dash 001R and parcel ID 029490R. It's approximately 1.297 acres of land lying and being part of section 11, Township 7 South, ranging 
Range 10 West, Gulf County, Florida, from residential to mixed commercial residential and providing an effective date. Um, at your last meeting, you all voted unanimously to accept that recommendation of the PDRB, and the, today is the ordinance for the public hearing to ratify that comprehensive land use change. Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to you. Do we have anything from the public? Do we have any comments, anything from the public? A motion to accept this? Chairman, I'll make the motion to adopt the ordinance. I got a motion by Ms. Bryant. Second. Second by Mr. Yeager. Do I have any opposed? No opposed. Motion carries 5 and 0. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jones. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, in front of you, you have your monthly <coughs> report for the um, for the month of May. Um, Mr. Whitfield pretty much gave the report, so I don't, I'll be really brief. Uh, I, I do want to say, and I hope I wasn't remiss in leaving out my council and thanking them for all they've done. They've worked tirelessly with me for the past year, volunteering, meeting with me, and he left. But um, thank you for allowing me to have such a great council. At the end of the day, the numbers are up. We're going to continue to monitor them through our analytics program. Um, our paid media program and our, our social media program are working. This past month, um, we had 223 new likes to our, our Facebook page when we were averaging one to two a day over the last couple months. So those programs that we're putting uh, money into, like such as cost per click, um, in the month of May, we had over 18,000 visits to the site, and um, almost 6,200 of them were handed off from our site to our partners. So we're showing a good return on investment. Um, in this report, you'll see that there's a brand story. A brand story is part of the process when you do research and you, you take all the qualitative and quantitative analysis down, and, you, and every brand has a story. Nike has a story. Every brand has a story. It's in your packet. It was voted on and um, amended as part of the, our guiding principles from my council last week. And it, it's not going to be printed. It's not an advertisement. It's just as we move forward on our strategies and our creative assets, and our marketing, that will be part of the foundation of what we do. Oh, let's see what else. We've had a real active month. We have some, um, some good response starting from the Hobie uh, writer's trip that we had. We're ho it's, Hobie has said that we'll probably make at least two or three covers, and we're starting to see some of those stories go. As, as I see them in press, we'll track the equivalency and report back to you. Authentic South had a great um, clip on the Indian Pass Raw Bar this month. That's an NB, um, NPR affiliate program, and I'm tracking the, the progress on that. They are going to come back up to WeWa and do an episode on the Dead Lakes. We've been filming quite a bit. Every, every um, event that the TDC sponsors, we film as much as possible, whether it's with JHG to promote it, um, Channel 7, or with Channel 17. So this past month, we, um, we filmed Kids Win, we did some plein air, we did Tupelo Honey Festival, and a, a, lot of, um, a lot of focus on the apiaries and up in Weewa. The next set of events that are coming up will be Big Bend, um, the 100th Day Celebration, and the 4th of July. So we'll be tracking those. The TDC does sponsor those. So my goal is to be there as much as we possibly can. Um, finally. Uh, we had a, an interesting um, request come in late last week. The South Gulf Volunteer Fire Department has been approached by um, a television producer and is interested in producing a reality TV show on the South Gulf Fi Volunteer Fire Department. And Melissa and Nick are here with us today, and um, they would like to. The producer would like to come to Gulf County next week and spend some time in here and produce what's called a sizzle reel. It's um, standard practice. You film, you put together a three to five minute reel that um, pitches the concept of the show to the networks. And I would like to ask your approval to um, work with Mr. Novak, make the contract appropriate for us, have it signed, and have them come to Gulf County next week. This by no means means we're obligated for the show. It just puts um, some, some guidelines into place that we've discussed this, uh, that they can pitch this to a certain <laughs> amount of time. I think it's 15 months to the network. Um, and it just binds us to this producer for this thematic show. Now, 
I've never done reality TV. I've done motion picture and commercial. Uh, my, I spoke with the majority of my council yesterday to be sure this is something they would want me to be um, part of. I spoke to Mr. Butler about it as well. I'd be more than happy to help manage this process. There's pros and cons to reality TV. Um, should it get picked up, it's a tremendous effort. There could be monetary gain through um, location fees and talent fees. And I'd just like to um, bring it to your attention and ask that I'm able to uh, work forward with Mr. Novick, get this, um, this agreement signed, and have him at least come do a sizzle reel for next week. Jennifer, yeah, I, I've spoken with you several times about this, but the sizzle reel actually doesn't cost anything. Doesn't, you know, it's basically something that they come down and film for a little while. And, and I, you know, end of the day, I think it's appropriate for you to work with the attorney because, you know, that obviously there may be some issues that we need to cover on, on liability and that type of thing. But you know, at the end of the day, I think that uh, a sizzle reel going forward would be appropriate. And at the end of the day, we can make a decision after that, you know, to say, you know, right. we're in or we're out. And uh, well, it gives me time to, I've met, I've spoken to the producer a few times, and I've checked out his credentials and, and um, what he's done. I have, I have addressed my concerns about coming down here and, you know, tarnishing our brand and our, our community. We work hard. We're a luxury brand, and, you know, I mean, that's going to take some brand and reputation management, but I, I, don't, I don't see the... The downfall of having come on If I can comment, I, I've spoken to Ms. Jennings about it, and I've expressed my concerns with regards to some of the liability issues that we're going to confront. Um, she explained this initial step is for them to come out and get some footage with regards to the community. Um, and I've expressed to her that we've got, if we go through this contract, there's certain steps or exclusions that we need to go through. She needs this initial step for them to look at the area. Um, I, I will review the contract if you all direct me to do so. But there are several layers of liability and complications with regards to your staff, with regards to volunteers, with regards to exposure for the county. Um, you know, if we're talking about volunteers, we're talking about fire departments, we're talking about emergency rescues. So there's a whole complex amount of issues that if the contract doesn't cover those, then, you know, I will come back and let you all know that. This initial step, as Ms. Jen's, uh, Jennifer's explained, is to have them come out and take some initial footage so they can put a, a product together. If that is the extent of it, and then it comes back to you all again to approve a second step, which is actually putting this product out at some point in the future, but I, I really caution the commission to control this issue and stay, obviously, we'll stay ahead of it through the contract, but not to permit any uh, marketing or exposure of this county through any type of media that someone comes down and takes some footage without Ms. Jenkins coming back to you all and first recommending it through her TDC and second going through a very strict contract terms of what exactly the exposure for the county is going to be. Um, you're talking about releases of liability and hold harmlesses of each one of these individuals, whether they be staff or volunteers. There's a whole slew of issues that would need to be addressed if this is something that you all want to pursue. And, I, and I've spoken with um, uh, Chief Stepke and uh, Larson, and, and they have the same concerns. They would never want to do anything that would, you know, put Gulf County in a bad light, li liability-wise, brand-wise, or anything like that. So we're trying to work together, and they've been, and I mean, the, this producer has been searching for a southern rural volunteer fire department in a remote location with multiple characters and personalities. And if you Google that, South County, uh, Gulf County comes up. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's pretty... Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I have been working with them and doing as much due diligence as possible with Jeremy and um, <coughs> last week. There again, I, 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 as far as the board's concerned, I think the most important part is to get the county attorney a comfort level that, that everybody's protected and those type things. You know, and I think we ought to move forward with allowing uh, them to come do the uh, initial footage, you know, and you might want to introduce them to Mr. McLemore and some of his antics on the river. <laughs> uh, that, that would be a good reality He's show, I'm sure. He's just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but some of you need that. <laughs> no, we'll do that. <laughs> that sizzle reel. Any more comments from the board? I just motion to move forward. I got a motion second. by Mr. McLemore, second by Mr. Yeager. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion carries five and no. Thank you. At this time, uh, Mr. Roger? Yes. Can you come on up? Yes, sir. Could, could, uh, Mr. Chairman, could we? I, I'm the one that asked Rogers and Miss Marcy to come to the board meeting. Is there any way that 
we could address Miss Marshy first. Sure. Yes. If you don't mind, Mr. Rogers. No, I don't. Okay. No, We're going to try to work through this and weed through this and maybe get some questions, you know, answered and all. Uh, and my first question, Ms. Marsh, thank you for coming. And my first question is going to be, why are we closing down the health department in Weewall? Well, the Those short things. answer to that question is we're not closing down the health department in Weewall, Mr. Commissioner. May I interrupt you then? Mm -hmm. Why am I getting phone calls that your staff is telling my constituents it, that they're shutting it down June the 30th? <clears throat> I've been meeting with all the commissioners for several months now who would agree to meet with me, as well as county staff, about the budget issues in the Gulf County Health Department. Uh, very similar issues to what this county of Gulf County is experiencing what the Gulf County School Board is experiencing, you know, a steady decrease in revenue funding that, as you said in the very first topic of the conversation of this board meeting this, after, this morning, you can't continue to operate a business that's in the red. I can't continue to operate a business that's in the red. Can I ask this, can you sure. let, please, why are we operating in the red? The state revenue, general revenue for primary care funding has been cut to the Gulf County Health Department by a half million dollars over the last five years. And my next question, why, are, why is Gulf County the only county in the state that is operating in the area? Uh, more than half of the county health departments in the state are experiencing budget shortfalls and are closing services. Um, reducing workforces, realigning their budget to the amount of funding that they have to support. So but, I'm one of probably about 40 health departments that are going through the same thing. But they're not operating in the red. You're operating in the red. Not, no, sir, not anymore. You're not in the red anymore? No, sir. Well, why are we shutting her down then? We don't, we don't need to close the health <laughs> department. In the north end of the county, if you're going to close the health department down, why not close the one down here in the south end of the county and work with Sacred Heart? We do have a hospital down here that we could hopefully work out with. We have nothing in the north end of the county. And, and I'm going back to a year and a half or two years ago when this board supported bringing you on board. Okay. I'm the one that did not support you. I said that we would be coming back, gentlemen, and dealing with this issue again. I know some of you have, we have some new commissioners on this board that were not involved with this, but I, but I was here. Here we are. We did it with again. We're not living up to the agreement. I went out and campaigned for Sacred Heart, and I'm going to get Mr. Hall up here when, in a minute. I'm the one that went out and campaigned for the half cent sales tax on the north end of the county to bring a hospital into Gus County. With the agreement that we would have actually a seven day a week health department operating on the north end of the county. That hadn't happened. We'd been back and forth for five days a week, but the agreement was that they would have somebody even on for weekends for emergency care. Now, Mr. Hall, like I said, you know, I want an agreement is an agreement. I've stuck my neck out on the line for Sacred Heart two years ago, three years ago, and went out and, and helped get y'all funded that half cent sales tax. Now, y'all need to get your act together. This board has already sent a letter of dissatisfaction to the state at one time. I tell you, I'm still not satisfied with your operations. My next question is, how many employees are you planning on laying off, and where are you laying them off at? Is it the north end of the county? Is it the south end of the county? How many? Okay, first of all, um I didn't make any promises when the half cent sales tax was passed. I only recently learned what some of those promises were that were made at that time. 
uh, I inherited a health department budget two years ago that was built on non-recurring dollars. And those dollars went away, and I got left figuring out how to continue to operate public health services first and foremost, and primary care services through my FQHC for this entire county. It became very clear that I couldn't continue to maintain the same level of service with a half million less dollars. I don't know anybody that could. Uh, since the day I stepped in this county, I engaged with Sacred Heart Health System to collaborate for health care services in Gulf County, not in the North End, not in the South End. So I have been arm in arm with Sacred Heart Health System since I got here to make sure that there's no interruption of public health services or primary care services in Gulf County. That's my biggest concern. But we have, we have. That would not happen. That's why I'm addressing this today. We have an interruption. We have your staff that's telling my constituents that June the 30th, we're going to shut it down up there. You're telling me, what is your plan with Lebo? How many, how many employees are you planning on laying off? Can you tell me? I sure can, Mr. McLemore. Well, let me finish my explanation. Uh, my explanation is when I was a half million dollars short and I had to look at how to downsize my services, I went to Sacred Heart and said, I have an FQHC. The scope of that FQHC that is negotiated with the federal government says that I will provide dental services in Weewa and dental services in Port St. Joe and medical services in Port St. Joe. The medical clinic that operated in the Weewa Health Department site has never been in the scope of my FQHC. That was the only aspect of my program that I could reduce. Fortunately, I was in collaboration with my health care, my primary health care partner who wants to provide primary medical services in the same building for the same community, who in fact is going to tell you that he can do more for you than I ever could. So I felt like this was the optimal plan to downsize my primary care services for which I have a half million dollars less in funding than I did before I came here and he'll do it better for you at no cost to the county whatsoever. Public health services in Gulf County do not change one bit. Primary care services in the Weewall Medical Clinic in, in uh, the health department site will shift from Gulf County Health Department services to the Sacred Heart services. I am reducing my workforce by four people. I haven't finished the negotiations of that, and so I'm not at liberty to tell you who these people are and way that, where they live. It's premature to have that conversation with you. I've also impacted um, schedules of two of my providers to be able to accomplish this pretty steep reduction in services while at the same time trying to, trying to balance the challenge of not reducing my ability to generate revenue so that I don't continue to have to carve away at this because I don't make enough money to cover the cost. More than, almost half of the clients that I provide medical services for in my FQHC are uninsured and have no ability to pay. This county pays less of a percentage of support to my budget than any county in the state that is operating an FQHC in its health department. That's not true. I have the figures right here. Can we read them to you? Sure. Let me let me correct it. I, I think I'm correct. This board actually pays somewhere in your budget. Is it fifty thousand dollars? It's forty forty nine thousand dollars, and it goes to uh, ACA for a Medicaid low income pool match of $10,000. So that's $59,000. And I've got a figure for you before you give me yours. That's about $3 a person for each person in this county that lives at or below the poverty level. And, that's, and, and, and that is not counting. You have sent sales tax money, which, Mr. Hall, you're a part of this, that, that the county pays Sacred Heart Six, seven hundred thousand dollars this year mm -hmm. alone. So right. we shouldn't be here today arguing and struggling about good health care in Gulf County. But to answer your question, actually Calhoun's number is thirty five thousand five hundred dollars. 
I said what percentage of my budget. I didn't say the amount that is provided. Uh, the county provides me 1.4% of my total budget for support for medical services. It is by far the least percentage of any of the eight counties in the state that run an FQHC in their health department. I said percentage, not amount. Uh, the half cent sales tax dollars that are generated in Gulf County that have been since that tax was passed, it generates about $400,000 a year. The Gulf County Health Department doesn't get a penny of that money. And, and that's when I want to talk to Mr. Hall concerning this. My point is we shouldn't be here today arguing about health department <coughs> or health issues in Gulf County with the amount of money that this board has went out and campaigned for to put into health care. We shouldn't be here today. Mr. McLemore, I don't think we're arguing. I think we have brought you an optimal plan where services are not only uh, continued but increased by the health care provider that's more appropriate to provide those services than the Gulf County Health Department is. Why, why then am I getting phone calls from your staff saying that we're going to be closed from June the 3rd? Why am I getting phone calls saying, well, we're going to only open two days a week? Talking to me well now. Down here it's seven days a week, full of blast, 24-7. You know, but, but I can tell you this. The North End of the County, we pay taxes up there. And the value of the dollar is just the same. Just the same. Absolutely. We may not get as much property taxes or whatever on the North End of the County, but our dollar is exactly the same. And we should be allowed the equal part. I think that the commissioner said I that have agreed to speak with me over the last several months about this issue would all be able to agree out loud that I have advocated from the first day to make sure that services were not impacted to the north end of the county. That but, was a number one priority as I was forced to downsize my operation to match my budget. My number one priority was no interruption of, of any kind of services for the north end of the county. I met with four of the commissioners who all heard me say that, heard me agonize through the different angles of how to best solve this solution so that the north end of the county is not only not impacted, but improved upon. And so, that's the plan I've So started. that's what you're telling me then, that we're going to be okay? Is, is Absolutely. That, is that what you're telling me? Absolutely. And we're not we're having no shutdown? I am closing the Weewa Medical Clinic. I'm, Sacred Heart will pick up and run the Weewa Medical Clinic. Mm. I am not closing public health services. Mm. You can talk to Mr. Hall about I would like to get Mr. Hall up now, if, if, if they would mind coming up. Don't mind at all, sir. And thank you for coming. Mr. Hall, yes, sir. would you tell me what's in the plans for the We Will Help Department? Yes. And my first question, I, I've heard this, Miss mm -hmm. Marcy, you know that, that this is going to be better, you're going to provide better care, you're going to put more programs maybe up there. I, I think my biggest question is, are you going to provide engine care yes, if you need it, or are we going to have to pay that regardless <coughs> rate when we come into the hospital, which, you know, part of that tax fund was for engine care. Yes, sir. So I would like to hear from you. Sure. Uh, our plans are, as soon as we can get our people and we're working with Marsha so that those employees will not be displaced, so we'll like to continue those in point. Don't have a precise date, but we're looking at mid-July, so they will. There probably may be a, a two-day, uh, a two-week uh, delta on the time that she closes down till we're able to get all of our people oriented and trained. And we're going through that. It, you know, on, on the issue of energy and care, our hospital this year to date is going to provide <clears throat> close to $5 million worth of energy and care. So if we look at the half cent sales tax, I, I certainly uh, feel that we're living up to our commitment on uncompensated care. And we, and we provide applications to charity care where the people don't even, after they make the application and qualify, 
they receive no bills, so there shouldn't be any issue on what we do as far as charity care. Uh, you know, half cent sales tax, I believe, Jeremy, we get, what, $700,000 a year? <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a pretty good return. Well, it's a good return, but it, the, the people are, are giving you that money, so you're not giving us anything. You know, the half, cent, you the, the half cent sales tax truly helps that. Sure it does. Absolutely. So it's it's all a teamwork. Can you give me a specific date when, when on the Weeball Health Department that we're going to be back in operation? The way I hear this now, come, when are you getting out, Miss Margie? Is it June the 30th or? Last Friday in June. I'm in the information I have from my people, we'll, we'll be open mid-July. I, I don't have that date. I can give you that date um, this afternoon. So are you going to, is Sacred Heart going to provide the same services? Yes. Uh, more services? Or are you, are you going to we'll be provide more services from the perspective. We'll, we'll have technicians up there on scheduled times to do x-rays. We'll have scheduled lab draws and we have the lab technician, so we're actually expanding the services from, mm -hmm. from what's there right now. Good. That's what I needed to hear. Yeah. I don't need to hear the fellow, the phone call saying we're going to be shut down come June the 30th. No, sir. No, 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 no. I don't need to hear that. That's no, not no. what we work for. That's not what I work for. We're just bored, and and we don't need it. I, I need, I, I, I understand, the state, Miss Marsh, whatever reason may be, is financially difficult, whatever, everybody's cutting. But I'm truly hoping that Sacred Heart will step up to the plate and help us with this issue. We'll, we'll be there, and, and Marsh has, has worked with us on, on that transition. So there will be, um, we estimate, a, a week, two-week interval that we'll be there, and the services will will be expanded from what the county health department is I, providing. Thank you. I have no other okay, questions. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, Mr. Hall, please, one question. Uh, sure. Thank you again. Yeah. You and I have had several conversations yes, over this, and I'm going to direct strictly to Sacred Heart, not toward the health department. Okay. But uh, with the uh, with this restructuring, we were right in the middle of a meeting the other day, and Sacred Heart may be doing a little downsizing in its employment. Yes, sir. All right. It, how is that up going to be over in the western part of the county? Will it affect us in here? Will that have any effect on the, you opening this no. uh, wing up in Weaverhitchka? You know, the Sacred okay. Heart Health System right now, <clears throat> Medicaid has reduced our reimbursement as a system $22 million. Okay. So, uh, and that's Pensacola. They're going through... Hmm, about a $22 million uh, redistribution of expenses. In other words, we're, we're going through a reduction in forces. The number of impact to Gulf County, uh, I finalized that plan, will be uh, one person that we haven't been on the open position for seven months that we will not be hiring. Uh, that's the impact to Gulf County. We'll still have a payroll on a go-forward basis of the next year close to uh, $7 million for the people in Gulf County. Okay. I'll be here. Right. Thank you for coming, Mr. Call. All right. Right. Just, just sitting here listening to what's going on with the health department, what's going on with our probation. Once we sit back and look at it, it's a shortfall of just money. Having a shortfall of money, and and we got such a small county, but the way our county is set up, it is it, set up on different scales, and it's it's hard for us to keep facilities for everybody. And and, and I want to thank Sacred Heart and the health department for coming together, working in conjunction trying to work out this problem that we have. And if a lot of more of our entities start working together, a lot of the problems that we'll have that we having right now, I think we could probably solve some of them. So like to have a kind of staff business. Uh, just 
got you. Here's the share. Right? I don't have anything. Mr. Joe? Mr. Wong? Michael? Our attorney? Mr. Chairman, I didn't know. Do we need a resolution, uh, the amendment on the RBEG from the 60 to the 80,000 hour amendment? Do we need to get that ratified? Right. It, Mr. Chairman, if you all recall, we had a uh, rural uh, development grant for uh, developing businesses, I believe a month ago that you all uh, approved to go out and advertise. Um, we've come back since then, and I believe it's the USDA has indicated that we're going to need a $20,000 in-kind contribution from county staff of services and, uh, and various contributions, not monetary, but a $20,000 in-kind for us to secure that grant through the USDA. Um, so what I'd ask is if we can amend, it's a $60,000 grant that we'll receive if we're approved. Part of that grant requirement that wasn't in the original resolution is that we have an additional $20,000 match in kind from the county staff. With your approval, I'd like to amend that resolution that you've already approved this to qualify us for that grant. Um, and again, it's not, a, it's not going to affect our budget, but it's going to be pulling from various resources and staff to get that amendment through. Sorry, uh, can that go back to, I mean, county staff's put an awful lot of work in that already. Yes, sir. I mean, can that go back to the amount that they've already put? It, it does reach back. I mean, since we started the process, it, it, it's, it's a formality through USDA to show that the resolution was approved from this commission that is not just a $60,000 grant, but that the county is actually contributing to the in-kind services. If the board remembers, this was a grant that actually USDA was trying, is having a little bit of difficulty getting to rural communities uh, these type of grants. And basically what it does is help your businesses in your community and works with them on different ways that it can help your businesses. So uh, I'm good. I'm glad that this goes back because county staff's already put a lot of work in that, in that kind of thing. So I'm good with it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so moved, Mr. Chair. Motion by Mr. Yeager. Second. Second by Mr. Michael Moore. Do I have any opposed? Mm -hmm. Opposed. Motion carries 5 and 0. Mr. Chairman, I have one other small item um, with regards to uh, the reimbursement from BP for the county. Uh, I received from our uh, special counsel at Beasley Allen last evening, um, there were some incidentals and uh, expenses by the county back in the summer of 2010. Um, and last night they sent a um, acknowledgement. It's a partial reimbursement to the county for dispersed uh, costs. It was $29,688.11 that we had all submitted to BP for reimbursement for additional expenses and materials. And, this is a partial, um, but it's a reimbursement on that. We're still moving forward with our suit. Um, nonetheless, we have a disbursement schedule from Beasley Allen. I'd like authorization for the chairman to sign that so we can get that back to them. The net to the county at the end would, after costs and the fees, would be $20,781.68 reimbursement to this county. So I'd like permission for the chairman to sign that so I can get this back to the attorneys and get it back to BP. So moved, Mr. Chair. Got a motion by Mr. Yeager. Okay. Second by Mr. Mike Daniel. Do I have any opposed? Opposed? Motion carries 5 and 0. No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, first item, uh, we got a possibility. Monday, I got notified by DEP that DEP and FWC uh, is offering a grant. Um, the reason I'm going to you today is because it's got to be turned in by the 21st. We don't have time for the next board meeting. But a grant to to uh, help educate the need for riding, um, or lack of riding along the beach for turtle, for turtles. And this grant is, is, is probably going to be a five to $10,000 grant but to be determined at this point in time. No local match for us. Dalton Mike Agent, my uh, current person, he'll, he'll be actually handling the grant and signing this grant application. But my recommendation to you allow us to go out for the FWC DEP grant for educational purposes for county riding ordinance. John, is this similar to the grant we've got before? We a few years ago, yes. And this will help out. This will be some TV ads that we'll be able to put on TV to educate us and visitors. Also, it'll be uh, the stickers that are going in the light switches <clears throat> to alert the people on the coastline and turn the lights off at a certain time of day or not turn them on. Yeah, this affects mine and Commissioner Brimes. No cost to us. So no cost. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Got a motion by Mr. Yeager? Second by Ms. Bryant. Do I have any opposed? Any opposed? No opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Uh, just to 
just say again, tomorrow, 9 o'clock, 9 to 12, the multi-county watershed meeting, the uh, the nature, nature Conservancy will be heading that meeting up. They'll be handling the meeting. It's going to be Walkover, Franklin, and Gulf counties. Looking at watershed issues, those things that we can do um, that will up the water quality, eventually up the water quality, those projects, whether it be economic development or environmental. Purpose of the meeting is it's a publicly noticed meeting. Uh, purpose of the meeting to try to figure out any reason what to do so we don't have a lot of overlapping projects uh, that will eventually be paid with BP money. But just, just your notice. Um, city of Port St. Joe, they have offered a couple more days, the 17th and 18th, for the joint city county workshop. Uh, sound like not all of the county commissioners can be there on the 17th. We uh, still have the 18th open. If the county commission can meet on the 18th next week, we could um, we could set any time during the day. The city is okay. If the board could go ahead and tie that meeting down. I, ha I have no problem with that. I don't know about the rest of the board members. I'm good with the 18th. I'm good. Mr. Butler, 18 sounds like it's good for the board. Okay. Okay, I'll make contact with the city. Uh, my last item that came in today, uh, Lee is here, and I always look at Lee. Um, Lee hasn't said a word about this. Uh, we did get our latest notice from ISO. You see the ISO ratings for your building department. And to give you an idea, like in 2007, you were looking at, I'll back up, a 10 number in ISO is, is the worst number you can get, and the one number is going to be the best number you can get. Um, a few years ago, we were at eight for residential and eight for commercial for building and for insurance purposes. <clears throat> Today, we, we got a uh, better notice here for four. We have an ISO rating of four for residential and ISO rating of three for commercial. It equates to a lot cheaper insurance Huge. rates uh, for newly built structures. So it's one of the best things we've done. We've never been this low. Probably very few communities are this low, but a four and a three is good numbers. Don, you may want to elaborate on our meeting with the ISO. Mr. Uh, Reagan, I was having like a sweet four hours. We had a meeting in, in Tallahassee. It was with ISO. And in the ISO is not only rates building departments, like we do in this case, but also rate fire departments. And, and our effort was in the we had a lot of people in that meeting, and the effort is try to figure out some way to reduce our insurance rates for everyone. Some things we're going to do. We all agreed to go back to another meeting, and another meeting is scheduled, I think, in Daytona, probably in November, I believe. But um, the ISO ratings um, that we have, we have, we have across the board some pretty good ratings. Um, I think Old Street probably has one of the better ratings. Um, Single Beach has a good rating. We're just going through four our fire department, just went through ISO again a few weeks ago, and we're probably going to at least retain or reduce our ISO ratings in our fire departments for those four departments, or the nine that we have. But the idea is the ISO is, is looking at some common sense uh, things, too. One is right now they're looking at five miles out. If you're more than five miles from the fire department, that's this you're going to have high fire insurance rates. They're looking at the possibility of seven miles out if certain things happen. If you don't have a lot of traffic between point A and point B, uh, if you can get to a five quickly, uh, traveling up three to six would be a lot different than traveling through 23rd Street in Panama City. And so the mileage doesn't count sometimes. So they're trying to relax some of the rules. And they haven't done it, but they, it's in the works to possibly do that. There's some things that we had we had, as Gulf County offered, um, paint the whole picture trying to figure out how we're going to reduce fire insurance rates for everyone. It starts more uh, before we get into the fire department. Some things that the County Commission did in April 1998, the subdivision ordinance that required uh, fire hydrants uh, with a minimum distance between those fire hydrants and those communities that have water system. That pays off because your fire insurance rates are cheaper if you have fire hydrants as opposed to not having those. And some proactive things the board had done way on back is really going to hit you in the future. 
And that's that's idea, not just for Gulf County, but for all the counties in the state. Um, and I saw they, they took notes, we took notes. I learned some things in that meeting that we all ran the table that day, week before last, learned some things in the meeting. But the whole effort was to figure out some way to reduce fire insurance rates. And, and it's going to reduce. Yeah, I, I think the key is the fire marshal's office has worked with me for over the last few months in, in trying to get this meeting scheduled. What the biggest uh, accomplishment was is, is for them to get the ISO people to sit down with us. And the, the top guy in the southeast sat down with us from the ISO. A lot of times, you know, this is going to be a tough budget year. And it's going to be difficult for us to maintain what we have in services without increasing. But the ISO ratings can return to the taxpayer many more dollars than what we, you know, what we'll take possibly in taxes. So I think this is one way that can help the taxpayer. And I think it's uh, it's uh, an education process that with the ISO guy learned some stuff from rural communities that he didn't know, and we learned some stuff from him. So I think at the end of the day, we can continue that process. We can certainly reduce some, some fire insurance rates for our constituents. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Chair? I just have a, a couple of quick items. Um, in the information packet, I, uh, we have a meeting agenda policy. I've met with the attorney, Mr. Novak, and he drafted the policy. And I'm just asking the commissioners to <coughs> take a look at it and review and come back to Mr. Novak with any comments or suggestions that you may have. And we can look at it uh, at the next meeting for a, a possible vote. My, my other item is um, I had a while back I had requested some travel figures and some folks in the public had followed up to ask, ask if I had received them so I submitted them to the information packet and I just want to state that for anyone who received the information packet it, the headings did not come through if you got it by email and I just wanted to state what those headings were and it's expenses and then fiscal year 2011 fiscal year 2012, and then the e increase or decrease, just for clarification purposes, the, the totals are at the bottom. So that should clarify. And, and um, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have one, one item. Mr. Rowley, he's in the audience today. And Mr. Ro Mr. Rowley, I would like, if you would, to go ahead and schedule us a meeting concerning the honeybee issue. I know that we've been bouncing that around, and we've looked at this, looked at that, but I am ready to move forward with that. So, um, to the board, Mr. McMullen, since the last meeting, well, the meeting, first meeting last month, mm -hmm. I, I was giving an assignment to uh, looking at getting some of the uh, uh, appropriate people that can address this issue. Mm -hmm. Since then, I've contacted our doctor. Uh, Jamie Ellis, who is a renowned apiculturist at the University of Florida, he'll consider to come out sometime next month and sit out with us. Also, okay. uh, David Westerville, who's the chief uh, uh, bee inspector for the state. Over the state. Yeah. He's going to come out to and we're going to sit down and uh, what they suggest is going to sit down with um, some beekeepers from here in the area, uh -huh. also with some residents from where we're having the problem at. Mm -hmm. And we have a round table discussion on the problem. Mm -hmm. It's some um, revelation that you and I are not aware of that coming down from the state mm -hmm. that govern this, mm -hmm. and we need to let them explain this to us. Okay. So sometime in the mid part of July, okay, uh, we will certainly have a meet. Okay, good, Mr. O'Leary. If you like, I say if you put that together for us and and give us a date, you know, or give me a, de a date and and a location. I I don't care where where we need to go with this. You know, I just need to sit down somewhere with the right people. I'm moving forward with it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Carter, include my friend Mr. Williams back there. Citizen, he would like to sit in on this. Okay, all right. You would. All right. You... All right. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I don't want to have anything today, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right quick, and we'll go to the public. Uh, the old health department, which we... Starting over from Mr. Carter here, I see uh, Mr. Mark is in here, and we have finished our, our finishing, as we talk, the third phase of four phases up there. And Mr. Mark, where are you? Yeah, okay. It's my understanding that we came up 
about 1,800 stills money. Back in a pile of oars, the fourth phase, which is the kitchen area. So we submitted 5,000. We've got 1,800 left over. Yeah, but where did the fourth stage come from? <laughs> it was in there all the time. Oh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Who knows? It was in there. <laughs> uh, Who knows? Uh, I think the board committed 5,000 5, to it, so I don't have any issue with yeah. with spending another 1,800 on that. On the fourth stage, have you come up with a number, Mr. McDaniel, yet on the fourth stage? No. No. That's but we are in the black. Huh? Yeah, let's do that. He's wrapping up today on it, and so Mr. Carter's room will, should be ready for him to, and he's probably, yeah. now, you want to tell the commissioner this fifth or this kitchen area is very important. Miss Louise, you got to have a kitchen. Hey, exactly, <laughs> and you know it, and I know it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to Mr. Mark and his staff, uh, we've managed to squeeze a few dollars to make that a reality. We appreciate y'all. They've done an excellent job. Yeah. Mr. Novak, uh, that store will be, uh, you and I need to get together and help us be working on tuition. Yeah. Which store? Uh, We'll get us a big old oh, stove. Yeah, <laughs> okay. But uh, there, have we have we received any uh, bird parker drive? I know with the the rivers up and hadn't gone down and any damage there. You know this is. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually learned some information on that just this past week. Through maybe the grapevine or whatever, but I'm I'm being told that there's uh, some grant funds out there. That's going toward Bird Parker Drive and also up there on Cutoff Drive. Good. So that's just rumor now, you know, down through the grapevine there. But but did we receive any damage? I haven't seen any. Mr. McDaniel, it still looks like it's intact right now. Uh, you know, one of the things that we got passed through the legislature this year was an extra $50 million in scrap, scop, and CIGP. I'm not sure at the end of the day, I've, I've got a call in the DOT to how are they going to spend those? Are they going to move projects up or are they going to ask for additional projects? But that may be something that we need to check on because that money will be available July 1. And so, Don, if, if you'll help me touch base with Tommy uh, Barfield on that, that'd, that'd be good. Uh, yesterday, the county employee and we installed the signs in the Kemp Cemetery area. Uh, notices to the people that's trying to get to Gulf CI that there's no entrance to Gulf CI to Kemp Cemetery. So maybe we've corrected that problem a little bit. Those signs were put to uh, uh, so hopefully that'll be helpful there for not only for the Gulf CI but for the people too. Next uh, last uh, meeting uh, the Port Authority came before the board and uh, offered us a uh, possible first uh, mortgage or first, uh, anyway, on this Arizona property. Have you given any, anybody given that any more thought? I, I think that uh, Mr. Novak was going to attend their next Port Authority meeting and extend that and, and, and get a... If, if we have, a, if I have the permission of the commission and they have the authority to do it, then I'm going to draft the documents and ask the chairman to... It's not going to be the chairman, it's going to be the Port Authority, actually probably the executive director or the chairman of the Port Authority is going to execute that mortgage modification and um, collateral uh, substitution. So if I have the permission of the commission, once they have their vote and approval, then we'll, I'll draft those documents and have them sign them to accept that. And then the other question will be certainly in terms of the terms between the five of you. I would recommend to give me the ability that once they approve, I can come back to you all so you all know. I know there's questions about terms and, and time. Um, the specific financing and the interest that's been discussed in the past, I would encourage you all to keep the same. In terms of the extension of time that you're all talking about, I'd like to be able to come back and present that to you all so that if, if there's defined terms of, they mentioned five years when Mr. Costin was here two weeks ago. So if that's the case and they come back with that, I'd like to be able to present that to you all in final form to pro, uh, provide the chairman the authority to sign. You need a motion to proceed like that? I, like I said, I'm going to go forward and in, 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 in next 13 days, I believe, we're having a meeting on Monday following. So that will be presented to you all for the chairman to have the authority to uh, approve those. Um, but it will be the Port Authority that signs those documents once I present them to you. I'll try to get them in the consent if it's done by next Wednesday. One other question. Let me address the flyer here. Uh, Rick, could you give us an update on our SHIP program? I've had inquiries and uh, I said I'd bring it to 
meeting and maybe get some information. You share just a little light on it, please. Uh, right now, we're we're working on uh, the CDBG housing grant along with SHIP uh, programs. Uh, I'd say just a little bit of history there. About one and a half, two years ago, uh, the board allocated $125,000 worth of SHIP monies to assist with the CDBG grant as match. So right now we're, we're working on that, that match. Uh, we received approximately 60 SHIP applications and probably, Juan can probably help me, 20-ish uh, CDBG applications. Um, we're combining those. Jordan and Associates, who handles the CDBG uh, program, they're reviewing those. I believe they're going to be inspecting homes uh, this month. Uh, after that's taken place, we will then move forward and review the SHIP applications, uh, which I su suspect probably next month, and start making those decisions. Much. Thank you. One other thing. Uh, Mr. Bryan, any information packet I was going over it and uh, your second item reference to travel. Uh, I've reviewed these numbers and uh, I just want to tell you I'm not satisfied. Are you satisfied with these numbers? Well, why don't you expand on the talk? Well, I'm just saying I don't, uh, I'm looking at some of these travel numbers and I are you unhappy with the accuracy? Do you think they're yes, not accurate? I don't think these are correct numbers, and to get out to the public, the public needs to use correct numbers. Um, maybe Ms. Herring, who well, prepared I, the numbers. I spent correct. time with her yesterday, Fine. and our numbers and <laughs> correspond to these. Mr. Mr. Matt Daniel, you're the only one. I know who one is correct. I know who one is correct. Here's his correct. Correct. The rest of them, for mine, I have a question. I can't. Mr. McDaniel, I tried calling you yesterday after we met. I did research um, the specific one we were looking at. And um, as I explained to Commissioner Bryan when she first requested this, you know, how our system is set up. And some of the complications on yours has to do with the fact that you and also um, Chairman Smiley did not receive your credit card till the end of 2011. So your expenses would show up under someone else and it would take digging for those expenses to go and pull this. But your overall number as to what was charged to out-of-county travel for the county commissioners is correct. Our system is not designed to break it down by um, specific conferences or even by person. The way the budget is set up, y'all have approved it to where all out-of-county travel for the commissioner's budget goes into one. Now, if that's something we want to look at addressing going forward in budget year, we can separate it out. But the numbers as to what was charged for travel for those um, departments or orgs is correct. The final numbers are. Now, the conference number or the districts, that part I had to go in and pull individual receipts, credit card statements, travel vouchers and try to backtrack that information. So, and I think even in my email, I explained to Commissioner Bryan that is presented in the packet that given our resources and given the time frame without spending months pulling paper and doing it, this was the best I could get. But the overall numbers are correct. When you break it down by district and by commissioner on that out of county travel, yes, they're there is some question there because it's done manually. And I did not have time to pull every single credit card statement and pull, um, you know, for the most part, if it was on, I'm going to use you as an example, if it was on um, Commissioner Yeager's credit card, I put it under Commissioner Yeager. Well, he may have paid for yours. That would take additional detail. You know, many times our administration, they, book, they do the booking a lot of times. They may put it on their credit card. So that's all stuff that if you want me to spend the time and pull every single expense, yes, it can come back. The way our system is set up, it does not easily pull that data. For, for the district, and I understand. I have a system right I, here. I'll sign my name right here saying I spent this much as a tax. Yes, Here's sir. money, but your numbers are nowhere close. Yes, sir. And if you want me to pull every commissioner's 
travel voucher and give you a manual total. Yes, I can do well, that. All I'm saying is when people ask for public records, let's give them some correct numbers. The overall totals are correct. I do think going forward, at the very least, that we may need to look at the way things are um, and coded and, and we have. Involved. I was also explaining before Commissioner Bryan's um, request, we had already started with those credit card statements to attach the travel vouchers. That had not been done in the past. You were looking two years back. That had not been done in the past. We had started to do that, but it was not fully in place for these two years. There's Additionally, since this request, we have started coding um, for FAC or NACO or Small County Coalition. But in addition to that, what goes, what we can pull out of our system is based on what's put in our system. So if the travel voucher does not state what it's for, then we have no way of entering that into our system. So if we get a trip to Orlando for a conference, and it doesn't, and it may even say a conference on such and such, but it doesn't say FAC, I don't know that it's FAC. And um, Commissioner McDaniel, I did speak with Mr. <laughs> Butler, um, and he suggested that some of the staff sit down with the clerk's office and determine uh, how we could improve on, on keeping track of these expenses within the system that we have. Well, you know, banks keep up with their money. I just, all I'm saying is this, when people go for public records and they get data, it should be correct data. It, it, the final numbers are correct, sir. I don't, well. And in addition, we go by governmental accounting standards. We do everything by purpose and by vendor. That's how it's coded. We have no choice on that matter. We, you know, and I, I can tell you from experience from dealing with Jennifer. When you're in private practice, you do more of a project-based accounting. Government doesn't yeah. work that way. And it takes transition. I mean, it, it takes understanding, and typically government accounting is not But I, I do think we need to make some improvements on that. Well, I agree with you, Commissioner. I agree with you. Thank you. That's all. Ain't, ain't nothing wrong with making some improvements on it, but we don't want to push it to the point where it's going to be more of a hassle. And yeah, but it's people's money. I understand what you're saying, Mr. Mike. Don't you? And I understand it's our job to look out for people's money. Yeah. But ain't no need of, ain't no need of making a job twice as hard when we don't have to make it twice as hard. I, I think it, it, it's appropriate that the staff has already agreed. Let, let them sit down with the clerk's office, and, and you know that, I think they can come up with the conclusion and come back to the board. That's it. Uh, Mr. Neese, you was telling me about we need two commissioners to serve on the value adjustment board. That was me. That was, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Neese. Yeah. We need two commissioners to serve on the value adjustment board and one citizen. That's the homestead property. Chairman, I've my time, so I'd suggest you, uh, you have well, actually, a couple of the new <laughs> Actually, um, actually, me and Mr. Um, uh, Mike Daniels is coming off. So, so, I mean, we have two on there right now, so, I mean, we got to, come on, guys. I, I think it's Commissioner Brown and Commissioner Maxwell for service and educational <laughs> fund. I, I've said my time in the past, Mr. Gager, before you got on the board, so... Uh, yeah, I think I've been there. Now two commissioners. <laughs> oh, we got Mr. Mike Daniels to go back on. And you're down here. You know, I, I, I don't Mr. have a yeah. 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 Commissioner I, Bryan would like to serve. I would, I would prefer not to at this time. I'll, I'll serve. I'll serve. All right. Mr. Yeager. Yes, sir. You, you got a kind of heavy schedule. Yes, sir. Since, since me and Mr. Mike Daniels are still on it, I go back on it. But I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate well, I'm that. Talking about. Well, that's going to be now, you still need one from the public, don't you? Yeah. Was Eugene Raphael the last one we yeah. did? Eugene first, yeah. last year and the year before. Well, why don't we just make that motion and we'll just tell Eugene he's got to serve again. So we for Eugene Raphael to be there. <laughs> <laughs> the public. Mr. Yeager. Second. Second. Mr. Mike. I like that. Okay. <laughs> we'll get that to Mr. Eugene. Mr. Smiley, you also had a, while you're on the process of appointments, yep. you have a request for three from the EDA. Um, 
that you need to, and I think Mr. Sellers is here, I think the first board meeting, general at large board meeting, the bylaws is coming up. So for this commission, I think they've requested three appointments from you all. I'm not sure. Larry, when the date is, I don't know if it's before the next meeting or Tuesday 18th. Okay, so. The board. I, you know, that's considered st staff, which, uh, in, I don't know, whatever the board thinks, but uh, it's probably a couple from the staff and maybe one board member, but... Uh, uh, I'm thinking that maybe we don't need a board member there. I, I, I don't disagree with that. That's yeah, we're good. trying to uh, get this off of our back and on the good friend back there, Mr. Sellers, is back, so maybe the uh, you know, citizens would be more there. That's my line of thinking, whatever the board finds. And I worry about staff and the, the time Fine. that, you know, the issues that they have already with getting there. And the, the so, first meeting, Barry, is before our next meeting, isn't it? Okay, y'all wait a minute now. Y'all think about this now. We sit here and tell us now because uh, they would not give us the information. And we didn't know what was going on. Without a staff member sitting on that committee now, we still may not know what's going on. So y'all need to think about that. Well, under the agreement, they are required to report. I mean, you can, you have full control under the EDA agreement. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Butler, our staff. Is our staff that we can put some of those guys on that? That's never been a board consideration before, no matter what you put on us. <laughs> yeah, we just got slapped. <laughs> I hear you, Mr. Butler. Right. Right. Yes, we do. I mean, can we put one um, staff member and then try to grab two from the public? Because, like Mr. Mike Daniels, uh, Mr. Mike Daniels, we need someone else to bring back us. Can we put to the board? Can we do this? Uh, can we? Put uh, Mr. Butler on there for the first meeting, and, and let's come back and, and get some staff recommendations for the for the three. Is that I mean, is that something the board would want to do? Whatever y'all want to do. Let's 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 do that. Let's appoint Mr. Butler as a, as as the representative right now, and we'll get you the other two names. So move for Mr. Butler. We got a motion by Mr. Yeager, second by Mr. Mike Daniels. Do I have any opposed? No opposed. Motion carries five and no. Mr. Chairman, one thing. Yes, sir. Just for clarification, Enterprise Carter needs a really clear clarification from the County Commission that EDA is going to be the point of contact where you can out development projects in <coughs> Longer County. Right now, it's me, it's the board, and that has not been cleared up. Even though we signed an agreement, they sent an email saying we want good, clear direction. So is it the board's desire for EDA to be the point of contact for all economic development? I think so. I think that was the, the I think that was the agreement of the board. Three two vote, but that was the agreement of the board. So so do you need a motion to that? Yes. So move to make the EDA the point of contact. Motion by Mr. Yeager. Second, Mr. Chairman. Second by Mr. Mike Daniels. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion carries five and zero. Oh. Did we clarify that? Did we move the meeting? Okay. Um, Butler, can you do that for me? Well, yeah, it's in the consent agenda. It's in the consent agenda. Yeah. Well, the, the, since the FAC conference, the year travel day is going to be on the 25th, which is normally can commission meeting day in two weeks, the uh, board is going to be 24th on Monday. So we meet at 9 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time on Monday, 24th, instead of the 25th. Do I have anything from the public? Well, yes, ma'am. Give your name. Sure. Christy McElroy, 1311 Woodward Avenue, Port St. Joe. Just a little clar clarification about these numbers and travel so that in the future, if someone pulls it, they won't be confused if Mr. Yeager's looks higher because Mr. McDaniels went on his credit card. Will there be some sort of disclaimer? Or I just want to make sure as the public when they pull these numbers up, they are clear with the understanding, the reason certain numbers, although accurate, may be skewed. I would suggest, for starters, given this specific summary, to look at the totals. 
Again, our system is not set up to do this. I did not pull every single credit card statement. I did not pull every single travel voucher. I would say if the public has a request and wants specifics on information, to do a public records request with specific information. If you want to see all of Commissioner McDaniel's travel vouchers, request that. This type of overall, our, our system is just not designed to do it. It would take many, many man hours to pull two years worth and, of And history. I understand that, and I do not, so I'm not but sure. I, I would say look at total. What you see here, <laughs> I mean, looking at the summary sheet, what you see here on District 1 through 5 in right. county travel is what was charged for those districts, charged to our books for that district. When you look at the um, approved for the chairman, that is what our books charge. That's what we wrote checks for. Right. And then when you look at the out of county travel for all districts, that total number is what our books reflect that we paid what we charged and, out and of I, county I, travel. And I understand that. I do. I, I'm not trying to, um, I'm not challenging at all your numbers or what you've put together. What I'm curious about is more you have the big picture and then you have a drill down. So if someone was to pull up, say for instance, <laughs> someone's travel, but another district was on another district's because they're the one that has the credit card, will there be information that is clear to the public that this is the way the process was then? And then to Ms. Bryant's point, please let me finish, to Ms. Bryant's point, moving forward, we'll have a more accurate picture of each district and what they spend. I think this is key because we have spent a lot of time talking about this in these meetings and people coming forward and making allegations that are provocative rhetoric. So that's why as a citizen, I want to make sure that I'm clear that there will be something. Motion. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Mike Daniels. Uh, second. By Ms. That there would be something clear that, okay, this, these were the rules of engagement then. This is how each district worked. There were certain districts that didn't have a credit card. And all you have to do, I'm sure the county attorney could put something together that would be clear to the public so that we understand that at that time, with those rules of engagement, that's how things were done. That is not something I can provide you, no. I went back and pulled the history. Now, if you want to know everything that makes up any of these numbers, yes, I can give you that, no problem. And Ms. Herring, um, if we've discussed all of this. Would, would you say that the discrepancy from one district to another would not be that big of a discrepancy if, no. if one commissioner in the very beginning, if when a commissioner came on and someone covered their um, uh, charges because they didn't have their card yet. It, it might be a little heavy, heavier on maybe on Lynn's card or Mr. And it Trump's should be card. few and far between. I did find a specific instance on the one that Commissioner McDaniel had asked me about. But for the most part, if I classified them as a specific district, there was a reason for it. If anything, I would say that they're few and far between. Okay. Most okay. of them are classified. Um, you do have some down here in other, and it was because it was on a credit card, and it said Holiday Inn. I don't know which conference that went to, right. so it's in other. Okay, and, and again, I haven't seen your numbers. Mm -hmm. Just as someone listening to this, just want to make sure that moving forward, or if someone was to pull this in a year or two years, they would not, it, it wouldn't misrepresent. You see what I'm saying? Given our resources, this is the fairest representation I can give you. <laughs> okay. If you need, if you or anyone else wants specifics of whatever these numbers detail, yes, that can be provided, and you I, can submit a public request. I don't want to request. tax the the hard work that you've already done. But as a general outline, this is A, B, and C. No, I I can't give you that guidance. I mean, there's that's all. I there have. may be many factors. Thank you. Do I have anything else from there? Can I get a motion to adjourn? A motion by Mr. Mike. Daniel, second by Mr. Mike. Oh, Sheriff, I'll be behind you now.